Hello, everyone. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. Um, welcome to today's webinar. We're happy to have you joining us this morning. Next slide, please. Again, we want to extend our warm welcome to today's webinar, Post-Pandemic Impacts on School-Age Youth Mental Health. This webinar is sponsored by the Northeast and Caribbean Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, or MHTTC, and we're housed at Rutgers in the School of Health Professions in the Department of Psychiatric Rehabilitation and Counseling Professions. My name is Kathy, and I am the project coordinator of the center, and we'll be introducing our center as well as our webinar presenters for today. The MHTTC is funded by SAMHSA, the Substance Use and Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, to enhance the capacity of the behavioral health workforce to deliver evidence-based and promising practices to individuals with um, serious mental health conditions. We also address the full continuum of services spanning mental illness prevention, treatment, and recovery supports. Uh, we offer training programs in evidence-based practices for serious mental health conditions, um, wellness and recovery, school mental health, Hispanic and Latinx mental health education, as well as online education courses. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And as a reminder um, that all of our training and events, technical assistance and resources are available to you at no cost. Next slide, please. If you're interested in staying up to date with the events and products that our center is offering, we invite you to please sign up to receive our email communications. You may do so by scanning the QR code provided in the screen, and I will also share um, the link in the chat box before the um, conclusion of this webinar. Following this webinar, you'll be asked to complete a brief survey. We value this feedback and use it to improve our activities and inform our future training events. The surveys are also important because our continued funding is linked to them. So we thank you in advance for your feedback. We also wanna let you know that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website within seven days of the webinar broadcast. At the time of this presentation, Miriam Dolphin Rittman served as Acting Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use at SAMHSA. The opinions expressed herein are the views of the speakers and the presenters and do not reflect the official position of the Department of Human, of Health and Human Services or SAMHSA. No official support or endorsement of DHHS or SAMHSA for the opinions described in this presentation is intended or should be inferred. We encourage you to interact with our presenter during this webinar and feature by using the chat feature. Um, please post any comments or questions you have in the chat and your questions will be collected um, as we go. And also during the end of the webinar, we will um, also answer questions during the Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. During our webinar, our presenter may post questions to you. So we ask that you please use the chat feature to answer them. The MHTTC network is committed to using affirming and respectful recovery-oriented language in all of our activities. We also wanna let you know that of the new three-digit dialing code for the suicide and crisis lifeline through 988. 988 um, is not just a suicide crisis line, it's for people experiencing a suicidal mental health or substance use crisis of any kind or emotional distress. It's also for people who are concerned about someone experiencing a crisis. You can connect by calling or texting 988, or you can chat online at 988lifeline.org. Calls, texts, or chats are responded by a trained crisis counselor. Now let's begin our webinar. We have Dr. Susie Millar and Sonia rodriguez Marto with us today. Sonia rodriguez Marto is a licensed professional counselor a licensed marriage and family therapist, a licensed drug and alcohol counselor, and a national certified counselor and an approved clinical supervisor. She is the senior director of school and community-based programs at Rutgers University, University Behavioral Healthcare, which provides professional development and intensive mental health programs to youth and families in public, private, and out-of-district school settings. 
She has been working with school-based mental health for the past 20 years. She has her own private practice where she works with adolescents and adults and is, is an advocate for children and families living in impoverished communities, immigrants, the Latinx community, and women and children who have experienced trauma. She has written several grants focused on expanding school-based mental health services in schools. She serves on several boards for schools and nonprofit agencies focused on supporting youth and families. She has presented on a variety of workshops on topics related to stress and anxiety among teens, integrating mindfulness practices in schools, completing suicide risk assessments, non-suicidal self-injury, supporting youth in schools and the community in a post-COVID world, clinical implications for working with Latinx youth and families, supporting immigrant youth in schools and on treating survivors, survivors of sexual assault and domestic violence. Dr. Susie Millar is a New Jersey licensed clinical psychologist and over the past 10 years, Dr. Millar has served as a therapist, clinical supervisor, program manager, and program director of school and community-based programs at Rutgers University Behavioral Healthcare. As a program director at Rutgers UBHC, Dr. Millar manages several school-based programs throughout the state of New Jersey and plays a lead role in supervising trainees in the APA-accredited doctoral internship program at Rutgers. Dr. Millar also provides a variety of trainings for school district faculty and parents throughout New Jersey on several topics, including trauma, anxiety, working with intense children, mindfulness, and social emotional learning. She has also presented at several international, state, and national conferences, including the annual American Psychological Association Conference. Uh, Dr. Millar also works in private practice, working primarily with clients struggling with depression, anxiety, and trauma. So at this time, I will turn it over to our presenters. And again, welcome. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you all this morning. Um, so today we're going to cover um, four objectives. We're going to provide you with an overview of the prevalence of mental health challenges among youth before and after the COVID-19 pandemic. We're gonna examine some of the specific groups of youth that may be more vulnerable to mental health challenges post-pandemic. We're gonna explore some pandemic related changes in behavior patterns and coping mechanisms that youth have adopted, including the role of technology. And lastly, we're gonna end with ways in which schools can identify students who experience persistent challenges and implement school-based programs to best support these youth. So we're gonna start with this question. Um, if you could give your students or clients one thing, what would it be? So you can go ahead and scan the QR code, or you can also join at slido.com and put in the code that you see there. So what, are, what is one thing that you wish you could give to your students or clients? Resilience. Confidence. Self-confidence, absolutely. More autonomy, optimism, mm -hmm. hope. Secure attachment, I like that one. Self-care, stability, comfort. The knowledge I now have, interesting, I like that. Support, safety. And if you've ever seen a word cloud, the bigger the word gets, the more people are putting in that same word. So we can see resilience is getting quite large. Hope, safety. Peace. So we're seeing some patterns here, right? So we're seeing that what we're really hoping to give our youth is the ability to feel like they can manage challenges that come their way. Um, and with everything that our youth have been through over the past several years, it's understandable that they would be struggling a lot more. So all of these words really show that we're all in that same place of really hoping to give them that ability to manage challenges that come their way and to do it effectively. So feel free to continue to, to um, respond to the question and we're gonna move on to the next slide. 
So how does the prevalence of mental health issues differ among youth before and after the COVID pandemic, right? That's a question that we get asked quite frequently. Um, and when I started in school-based back in 2012, um, Rutgers UBHC was in about three school-based programs throughout the state, and now we are in over 44 districts. So that really shows that schools are recognizing the need of incorporating mental health supports for their youth within their buildings. And really specifically within the past four or five years, we've really seen such an influx in the challenges that our youth are experiencing post pandemic and really kind of looking at ways to support them. So I really like the slide, same storm, different boats. We all went through the same pandemic, right? Each and every one of us on this call and the youth that we support. But the truth is that we all managed it in very different ways. And we all experienced it in very different ways. Many of us were fortunate that we were able to continue to keep our jobs and continue to be able to provide for our families, but that's not the case for all of the youth that we work with and may not necessarily have been the case for all of us on this call today. So keeping that in mind that even though we all experienced the same um, traumatic situation, we all experienced it in very different ways de depending on what our life circumstances were. We're gonna play this quick video um, that really kind of talks about that meant the teen mental health crisis post pandemic. While sticking with schools and a topic we talk about often here on Morning News now, mental health. And for many students, it can be a major factor in the success they might see at school. The CDC says the number of kids feeling sad or hopeless has gone up 40% in the last 10 years. Those numbers, of course, were accelerated by the COVID pandemic. Dr. Robbie Ludwig is here with us to talk more. She's a psychotherapist and an award-winning reporter. Good to have you with us. You know, some kids are excited to go back to school, but yes. for some, it is not a good time. This, describe some of the challenges those students are facing and has it gotten worse since the pandemic? Well, during the pandemic, I think what we saw is that it was harder to educate our kids virtually. It was harder for them to stay. Oops, sorry focus and I think some of the numbers declined over time and also in terms of social anxiety. So whenever you're away from something, uh, it, it can build up anxiety when you're returning to an in-person school. There's social anxiety, there's concerns about academic success for younger kids and separation anxiety. So all of these play a role in how a child feels when returning back to school. And there could be a, a difficult time for a lot of kids. So how can they shift their mindset? There can be problems at home. Uh, maybe they don't make a team or they get a bad grade. How can they help themselves here? I think it's, and this is where parents can come in and, and let their child know that they are there to support them. And really to use these situations and setbacks so you can help them to be resilient because that's what they will use in life. To view school as a fresh start. If they don't get the grade they want, talk to your teacher and say, what can I do differently? If you don't make a team that you're interested in, again, ask for feedback. Try something else. Focus on secure friendships that make you feel good. These are all things parents can remind their child to do to set an intention for the year so that they can make the most of the year ahead. What are some tips that you have for kids who might be having a hard time with, with some of these things? Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing. I mean, you want to observe, first of all, if your child is having a problem, set a regular goal. So when parents can set a regular schedule that's highly effective for younger kids in terms of adjusting to the school year, observe if they're having any emotional regulation, and encourage them to talk to you about their feelings and struggles, and just create that space. Family dinner time is a wonderful place for kids to talk. Sometimes for young teens, if parents stay up a little later, they're um, less resistant to sharing their emotions. Put those phones away. Parents and kids, Put the right? phones Dinner away. Table, right? I'm so addicted to mine. I put it far away. <laughs> Dr. Robbie Lovely, thank you so much. Good to have yeah. you on. And anytime we talk about mental health, we want to make sure you know, or if anyone you know is struggling, you can call or text the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988. So we really wanted to start with that video just to kind of give us an overview. And what we're going to spend the next... Um, 
few minutes doing is really going into some of those more specific, um, the, the specifics about what our youth have really experienced over the past several years. Um, so now we are several years out from pandemic, but we're still seeing an impact in terms of how our um, youth have experienced it. So some of the challenges that our children face throughout the pandemic are things like a change in um, structure and routine, right? So especially in the beginning, there was a lot of fear and worry regarding their own safety, the safety of others, what their future would hold. Um, we found that 29% had a caretaker who had lost their job during that time, during the, that 2020, 2021 time period. There was a significant loss of life events, whether it be graduation, prom, um, birthday parties at one point, right? getting to see family, connect with peers, being able to do sports and all these after-school activities. There's a significant shift in terms of what they were able to do. And for some of our kids, they're still reeling with some of that. Um, loss of loved ones, over 200,000 children lost a caretaker during that time period. And loss of security. Statistics show that about 55% experienced emotional abuse by a caregiver and 11% experienced physical abuse by a caregiver. And then of course that social isolation piece. And we're still finding that a lot of our youth are, um, are struggling with that component of readjusting to um, healthy socialization, being able to make friends and, uh, and support um, and get that support that they need, being able to communicate effectively. And of course the social and political unrest that continues to, to be in our country and in our world in general. So what are we seeing in our children? We're seeing a pretty significant increase in terms of depression, anxiety. We're seeing that they're experiencing low self-esteem, difficulty with peer relationships, being able to connect and maintain relationships. We're seeing that there's an increase in anger and behavioral concerns. So that externalizing way of navigating their emotions. And we're seeing a pretty significant increase in terms of uh, eating disorders. In terms of em uh, environmental stressors, we're definitely seeing some increase in family stressors, challenges within families for being able to communicate effectively and being able to manage stressors that come their way. Some of our children are still struggling with academic difficulties, depending on when their education was interrupted and how they're navigating transitioning back. Transition issues in a lot of variety of different ways, whether it be transitioning back to school, we're still seeing a pretty significant number of kids with truancy and school avoidance. Abuse, we talked about some of those statistics and trauma. So, one study really found that um, among U.S. high schoolers in 2021, they're finding that the girls and uh, youth identifying as LGB are um, experiencing and are, are more likely to experience sadness and hopelessness over the past year. Um, so you could see that about 37 percent were identifying that their mental health was not good among um, overall. And then we could see when compared comparing boys to girls, the girls were about 49%. And when we compared um, heterosexual youth compared to LGBT youth, we found that 64% of them identified as that they were not feeling well. At some point over the past 12 months, they were asked if they were feeling sad or hopeless. And we found that girls said about 57% and our LGB youth are about 76%. So we can see that these numbers are staggering. And this was 2021. So we know that that's continued to, that our, our youth are continuing to struggle. So according to the CDC, they found that one in three high school students reported poor mental health and about 50% of students reported feeling persistently sad or hopeless. And again, you can see those statistics comparing sex and um, LGB identity versus um, heterosexual identity. So we could see that 30.6% identified anxiety within our females and 43% of LGB youth compared to 25% um, identified depression of our females and 37% of our LGB youth. So these are definitely concerning statistics that we're seeing and something that we really wanna be mindful of, how do we support these youth who are feeling this way? We're also seeing a significant increase in terms of suicide rates. So post pandemic, we saw a decrease. And I think, you know, kids being at home 
it removed a lot of stressors at the time, but also created different types of stressors, right? So we saw a, a significant decrease initially, but you can see that it's significantly going up over the past several years. So about 12% of females are reporting a suicide attempt within the past year and 25% of our LGB youth. We're also seeing a pretty significant increase in terms of gun-related suicides and homicide deaths in youth. So this shows you some of those statistics on suicide death rates um, over the past several years. So we can see that there's a significant increase in terms of um, our black youth. It went from about 2.5% in 2012 to um, the percentage change was about 5.6% in 2022. Overall, it went from 4.5% to 6%. So these are statistics that we definitely want to be mindful of in terms of how we're supporting them and how we're tracking what we're seeing within our youth. So we mentioned that anxiety and depression are, are significantly increasing. And we know that anxiety disorders as a group are the most common mental illness that occurs within children and adolescents. There's a lifetime prevalence of about 15 to 20%. Um, and looking at statistics from 2012, 2012 to 2022, the, the anxiety rate in youth went from about 11.6% to 20.5%. Um, children with anxiety are also three times more likely to develop depression. And the reason for that, if you think about anxiety disorders as a group, it's really that sense of hopelessness. No matter what I do, I can't control the worry. I can't control the fears. And when kids live with that for a significant period of time, it can lead to depression because they start to feel hopeless. When we look at depression trends within our youth, we can see that from 2018 to 2022, there was a significant increase in terms of the rate. It went from 3.2% to 15.08%. And we also know that um, having another disorder is most common in children with depression. So that comorbidity um, with uh, anxiety, as we mentioned, there's about 73.8% who also have anxiety and 47.2% also have a behavioral concern. And sometimes we're seeing those behavioral concerns as a way of these kids who are experiencing these intense or internalizing feelings, it becomes more externalized because they just don't know how to ask for the help. And according to the Child Mind Institute's um, Child Mental Health Report, we found that about 80% of children with anxiety and 60% of children with depression are not getting treatment. And we know that left untreated, children with anxiety and depression tend to be at higher risk for a variety of different things, including behavioral issues. They tend to perform more poorly in school. They miss out on important social experiences and engage in substance use. And we'll talk more specifically about some of those symptoms in a little bit. I mentioned earlier that we're also seeing an increase in terms of eating disorder trends within youth. So from 2018 to 2022, we saw a 100.7% uh, increase in children under seven, the age of 17 visiting a healthcare provider because of an eating disorder. Um, the current statistic is that about 22% of children have unhealthy eating behavior, which could lead to an eating disorder. And 12% 12 uh, 12 of adolescent females have been diagnosed with an eating disorder. So it's definitely a concern um, that we're seeing such an increase in it. And there is a variety of eating disorder type treatments, but we are still seeing that there's not enough for what our youth need, especially for our families that um, aren't insured or um, only have Medicaid, we're finding that it's a little bit more challenging for them to find resources. In terms of substance use, we had mentioned that we're also seeing an increase in substance use and substance use related deaths among youth. So this shows you some of those statistics. So nearly four out of five adolescents um, were involved in a drug overdose death. Um, in, 2020, uh, 2000, in 2022, so we can see some of those statistics there in terms of that increase. And drug overdose deaths really, um, death really, uh, rates have increased faster among our Black and Hispanic adolescents than in some of our other adolescents, but we're seeing pretty staggering increases in terms of those numbers. And again, as we mentioned earlier, if our kids are struggling with more of these internalizing feelings, we're seeing more of those externalizing responses. So the substance use increases a lot of times tend to be related to them trying to manage those feelings that they don't know how to um, support themselves with. 
We're also seeing an increase in violence. So in 2021, the CDC found that 20% um, of females and 22% of LGBT, LGBTQ plus youth experience sexual violence. Um, and 15% of females and 20% of LGBTQ plus youth were forced to have sex. And these are based on youth reports. They also found that 23% of LGB youth were identifying as being bullied in school. And 7% of youth overall were feeling threatened or injured with a weapon at school. 9% were, uh, were reporting truancy due to feeling unsafe. Um, and we also found that significant numbers of youth were experiencing bullying electronically. Sorry, my computer's trying to shut down, so I'm just making sure it doesn't do that again. Um, so some of the um, contributing factors, we mentioned that they're experiencing um, increasing, increases in social isolation. And despite the fact that it's several years out, some of our kids still don't feel like they really have those um, strategies and those skills for how to maintain and develop relationships. That's something they're continuing to struggle with. We're still reeling from those academic challenges. I can speak from personal experience. My son was in kindergarten when the pandemic first started. So his kindergarten year was interrupted and that was such a critical year for learning to read and um, developing a lot of those skills. And he's in fourth grade now and he's still continuing to feel like he's catching up on that. So despite the fact that several years have passed, our kids who really struggled during that time, they're still reeling from it. Economic uncertainties, there's still a lot of families that are struggling um, with making sure that they can support their family and provide for them. And we're seeing an increase in terms of the cost of living. So if our families are financially struggling, it's becoming even more challenging for them to support their families. Witnessing violence, arguing in the home, we mentioned those some of those statistics about what they're seeing at home. And then we talked about those loss of experiences. And for some of our kids, they're still grieving that, still grieving the fact that they had some of these experiences that they didn't get to have. So anxiety in our children. So some of the things that you um, should be looking for, a lot of our kids experience anxiety in terms of physical symptoms. So these are kids that might be spending a lot of time going down to the nurse, complaining of headaches, stomach aches, just not feeling well. When our body doesn't know how to manage these intense feelings that we have, it tends to turn into physical ways of navigating it because they don't know how to put the words into it. Um, difficulty falling or staying asleep. So challenges with um, sleep patterns, avoidance. So kids who all of a sudden don't really want to be um, socializing, spending a lot of time in their rooms, putting their heads down, not really raising their hand and participating in class. And then we mentioned that piece about that a lot of times we're seeing that those um, emotional symptoms, that internalizing feelings turn into externalizing as a way of them trying to really express how they're feeling. It, it becomes so overwhelming for them not understanding what's happening inside their bodies that we sometimes see irritability, defiance, anger, frustration, more tantruming behaviors. At school, we might see a lack of focus or over planning. So those kids who need to know everything that's coming up next, they must know their schedule, must know their routine. They struggle with any changes in routine and then negative thinking, really kind of being very critical of themselves. Within our adolescence, we're finding unfounded or unrealistic fears, fears as well. Um, feeling nervous or on edge, they're quick to snap, their um, emotions kind of shift very frequently, apathy or decreased interest, and then those unexplained outbursts that really don't feel like they're um, in line with or connected to what their experience has been. And with anxiety, when we're really kind of looking at some of those um, behaviors on the, the surface, right? That avoidance, the over planning, the anger, the sleep issues. A lot of times it's really them trying to navigate those feelings underneath that they can't understand, feeling depressed, overwhelmed, grieving, feeling disrespected or embarrassed, having shame, feeling rejected. There's so many different components of what anxiety can look like and the emotional response to it. And especially with our youth, when we're quick to say, why are you feeling that way? Um, you're doing great in school. You're doing well. You have such a great life. It really undermines or minimizes some of those feelings that they're experiencing, and it makes them feel like they're not really heard. So depression in our children 
can also look like irritability or anger. When you're feeling hopeless, when you're feeling overwhelmed, um, when you can't really understand these big feelings, these big emotions, we're seeing that it can shift to these very um, externalized um, symptoms as a way of them trying to really express what's going on. So it's um, also this continuous feeling of sadness and hopelessness that they feel like they can't control, that it doesn't go away. It might look like changes in appetite or sleep, difficulty concentrating, increased sensitivity to rejection. So if they raise their hand and they're not called upon, all of a sudden this becomes um, a, a direct uh, rejection of them and they start to feel very overwhelmed by that. Or if you know um, they have a social interaction where they're not invited or um, or they, you know, somebody ignores them that they're gonna feel that very deeply. It might look like feelings of worthlessness or guilt, feeling that everything's their fault, that they have um, no control over things that are happening in their lives. It might look like physical complaints. Again, those are our kids that are spending a lot of time going down to the nurse, not feeling well. It might look like fatigue or low energy, despite how much sleep they get. They're oversleeping or undersleeping. They're getting um, interrupted sleep. And it might also look like loss of interest in pleasurable activities. So they're um, not attending to things that they used to enjoy. They're pulling out of sports or clubs. They're saying no to their peers or spending a lot of time in their room. And then when we look at adolescence, we're adding in things like irresponsible behavior. So they're forgetting their obligations, refusing to do homework or chores at home. They're um, not coming to work. They're giving up on activities that they used to enjoy, rebelliousness or risk-seeking behaviors. You might see that they're talking about driving recklessly or engaging in unsafe um, substance use or sexual behaviors. All right, and I'm gonna turn it over to Sonia to talk about some of those vulnerable groups. So we really wanna be mindful of uh, groups that are particularly vulnerable at this time. Uh, so we wanna look at youth who had pre-existing conditions pre-pandemic. We certainly wanna take a look at marginalized communities, um, immigrant populations, uh, youth that have recently transferred into a school, um, and youth who have experienced loss during the pandemic and post-pandemic. So we really want to be mindful of these groups and make sure that they have the support that they need. I'm going to talk a little bit about the behavioral changes that we're seeing in youth um, at this time. Certainly seeing an increased screen time. Um, so lots of kids super reliant on their phones, getting phones uh, much earlier on. At a younger age, um, altered sleep patterns, you know, staying up pretty late to either play video games or talk on the phone or FaceTime with their friends. Um, we're seeing changes in substance use, so certainly access, um, the concept of vaping, uh, where we don't even smell it or see it at times. We think they're um, you know, it's easily accessible. Withdrawal from peers and social supports is always something we want to be concerned about. Um, so I, I want to pose a question, if you could enter in the chat, how do these factors impact youth mental health? So how do you think um, these factors, these changes we're seeing, how do you think they're impacting youth today? You just type in the chat. Okay, isolation, yep. Yeah. Increased depression, hopelessness, lack of interpersonal skills, yes, overly reliant on connecting with people on the internet, poor social skills, poor sleep habits, decreased ability to function in everyday life, right? We're seeing low academic performance, um, worsening mental health issues, false sense of reality, refusal to go to school, absolutely all of these things low patients used to um used to instant gratification yes not um not used to waiting for things right they have everything accessible on their phones great thank you for sharing that okay so let's talk a little bit about some of the ways in which they're coping 
Um, so what are the coping mechanisms that youth have adopted during the pandemic, right? I think a lot of them have turned to the internet and connecting um, with people online. So a lot of um, youth we hear is talk about having friends online, but not necessarily friends in person. Um, we've also learned that they can easily access resources and uh, mental health supports online through the use of chats. Now there's online therapy, so they can just chat with the therapist. We have a number of um, hotlines that they can call. Um, so youth are certainly utilizing a lot of things related to um, related, related to technology. And so what role has technology played in either exacerbating symptoms or alleviating symptoms, right? So technology has helped kids stay connected with friends, um, their classroom and the world during the pandemic. And now they've also had the ability to stay connected with people online in ways that we haven't been, right? So the use of, of Zoom, um, FaceTime, uh, to be able to connect with people all over the country. And so that that has been very, very helpful. And as I mentioned previously, certainly the opportunity to connect online with uh, resources and therapy. Um, some of the downsides are that it has led to too many hours of screen time, right? So lack of socialization, lack of social skills, and very, very often comparing themselves to others and um, creating unrealistic messages about what they're supposed to look like, I think the other issue that comes up a lot is when they know that there's a party going on or friends are hanging out and they weren't invited, that it very easily uh, lends itself to feelings of um, not being included yeah. and them being very upset about that. Um, so you coping me mechanisms that they can use, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the different coping mechanisms, is certainly therapy or group support. Um, there's so many great resources out there for them to join online support groups. Uh, we're really, in our work, we're really encouraging uh, the participation of groups and trying to provide lots of additional groups, both um, during school hours, during lunches, and after school um, for students to be able to connect and learn that they're not alone in a lot of the feelings that they're having. I'm certainly encouraging them to connect with friends and family, spending more, times, um, more time uh, connecting and participating in activities, journaling, mindfulness, exercise is always important, and deep breathing. Um, so we have a couple of resources that we're going to share here. Um, we have a ton of mindfulness activity resources. We encourage mindfulness on a regular basis. So I just wanted to share out some of these activities and resources um, that you can use with students or even your own children or any of the youth that you work with in your private practice or community-based settings. Um, GoNoodle.com is a wonderful um, resource to get young kids moving and um, interacting in the classroom setting. Um, the four, seven, eight breathing and belly breathing techniques are also very, very helpful going on a mindful walk with kids. Um, this can be done during the day. Um, if you have an opportunity to take kids out of the classroom setting, noticing colors, paying attention to their senses. Um, we've got a link here for some mindfulness activities for teachers. And we certainly um, have also done work around visual imagery and progressive muscle relaxation. Uh, one of our favorites um, is also the uh, Take Five grounding exercise, um, and you can just encourage kids to uh, pay attention to five things that they can see, four things that they can feel, three things they can hear, two things they can smell, and one thing that they can taste. So we really like this activity, and it works with all ages. Um, we've also used the color zones of regulation. So curious if you could enter in the chat how many of you are familiar with this, how many of you of you are using this, and what your thoughts are on the color zones of regulation. But we like to utilize visuals with our our kids, particularly our young kids. Um, the thermometer is is a good visual for them so that they can help us identify how they're feeling. Um, so we have, you know, talked about body signals, what are some warning signs, and then we talk about what ways that they can use to cope with some of these um, feelings that they're having. 
Uh, we've also used the scale of emotional intensity. So we encourage kids to check in with themselves, to look at um, where they might feel um, on that scale of emotional intensity. So certainly the red zone means that they have high emotional intensity and that we encourage them to utilize some of the distress tolerance skills. And then if they're in the blue zone, we encourage them to use some of their emotional regulation skills. We also really like the distract with ACEs approach. Um, so uh, the A in ACEs is for activities. So encouraging them to use activities that require thought and concentration. C is for contributing, focus on someone or some something other than yourself. Uh, e is for emotions, do something that will create a competing emotion. And the, the fourth one is sensations, finding safe physical sensations to distract them from intense negative emotions. And so we talk a lot too about making sure that they build their support system. And for a lot of kids who have um, really complex family or home environments, um, or in a lot of the youth that I work with, they are often here alone or just with an aunt or uncle. They come from their home country and their parents um, were either left behind or they've been separated from their families. Um, so we really encourage them to connect with anyone around them, uh, particularly a teacher, a coach, uh, friends, um, and family friends. So we, we think that it's very, very important for kids to establish a support system. So what other things can we do? Um, we can really help youth um, try to create a sense of structure, routine. This can be very helpful for a lot of youth. Um, taking cues from a child. So, you know, what do they need and when do they need it? Sometimes they need space. Sometimes they need hugs. Sometimes they just need to talk about things and they need us to listen. So really just trying to identify what a child needs in any particular moment and recognizing that they're going to need different things based on how they're feeling. Um, so allowing them to ask questions and um, respond honestly and age appropriately. But I also think it's so important to create an environment that feels safe and that we do a lot more listening sometimes rather than um, speaking. Sometimes they just want to feel heard. Validating and acknowledging that their feelings are valid and normal noticing their changes in mood or behaviors, helping them create a toolbox of their own helpful skills. So this is really important. We, we do this a lot in our work. We really encourage kids to come up um, oftentimes with a, a physical toolbox or basket of things that they can utilize when they're feeling dysregulated and recognizing that when they have different emotions, they're gonna need different items or different tools out of their toolbox. Um, so really important for kids to identify what works for them. Some kids really like to write about things and journal. Some kids find that to not be helpful and they have more physical energy and they need to take walks or go shoot a, a basketball. So really recognizing that um, each child needs something different. And then being mindful of our own feelings and reactions and what's going on for us and how we might be impacting them. Um, so we do a lot of work in schools, and we feel that schools are really the ideal place to provide mental health supports um, because students can receive a full continuum of services. So we can really connect with the teachers, the nurse, the school counselors, the child study team case manager, the family, and really just all work together to provide support for the student or child. Um, programming often emphasizes a shared responsibility to fill in any gaps and to ensure students don't fall through the cracks. So really encouraging staff um, working in schools to talk a lot about who's working with what youth and making sure that we're not spending too much time on one child and neglecting other kids who might not be presenting with symptoms that we haven't been paying attention to, but making sure that um, we have a point person for, for most of the kids that we're working with. Um, having a strong connection between the school and the community um, is very important. We do a lot of partnerships with the YMCAs, the community family support organizations, um, really feeling like we can connect with the community and also providing programs in the community, not just in the school setting. And really moving towards a collaborative um, service model. 
to ensure that we have wraparound services, not just to support the whole child, but their family as well. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the strategies that we um, think are helpful for implementing supportive school-based mental health programs. Uh, we really um, feel like it's helpful to integrate a tiered system of support so that um, we can identify which level of support each youth or student needs and recognizing that for some kids, we're gonna need to do prevention work um, and going into classrooms and providing psychoeducational workshops at a tier one level. Um, tier two level might mean that we need a little bit of individual support and we need to check in with this youth on a weekly basis or a tier three level of support where we need to really ensure that this youth has lots of different supports in the building, including individual and group support, um, as well as family support. Um, we should really take consideration to utilizing a school-wide screening so we make sure we don't miss kids or have kids fall through the cracks. This um, identification process helps address mental health needs of all youth and ensuring um, that we can connect those youth to resources. Um, establishing school-based health centers or community partnerships with um, health and mental health providers can be very helpful. Um, so really not just looking at the emotional well-being of a child, but also their physical well-being and how could we partner with community agencies to make sure um, that we are providing supports in all areas. Um, and encourage and creating a healthy, safe, and supportive school climate. So really looking at providing a trauma-informed school, incorporating social and emotional learning into core curriculums, and really training teachers um, on this approach. And we've done a lot of work around um, utilizing the five core strategies. Um, so some of the additional strategies for addressing um, the mental health and well-being needs of youth include incorporating um, SEL into um, you know, all of their classroom settings, promoting parental engagement, supporting families and caregivers, rebuilding relationships with peers and teachers, um, thinking about creative ways to increase so, uh, school connectedness. How can we get a child to feel connected in their building or there's certain clubs that they might feel connected to, even if they're struggling in their um, academic classes or is there a sport they might be interested in? balancing academic learning opportunities with social, emotional, and behavioral support, and then providing resources for mental health. So uh, what can we provide that helps to um, reduce their stress and manage their anxiety? And then what kinds of programming and skills could we teach them to help build and foster resilience? We also want to make sure that um, we're taking care of educators and staff. Um, we, we spend a lot of time focusing on youth and what they need, but we also want to ensure that we are um, supporting the staff and identifying what their needs are. So we've done this a lot with um, needs assessments and Google surveys to kind of figure out what staff needs. Um, we've had some of our clinicians uh, do support groups for uh, some of the teachers, especially post-pandemic, to help them, uh, to provide them with resources, as well as help them identify some of the youth that might need more support, and then to also talk about their own self-care strategies. Uh, so we want to also think about what learning opportunities we can provide them, and then find a way to provide direct support. We've partnered with a lot of employee assistance programs, and some of our staff have also been um, tasked with providing additional support to staff in the after school hours. So we've been able to work closely with staff and then to eventually connect them with their own um, mental health providers. Um, some of the resources that I wanted to share um, with you that might help for building some of these school partnerships. Um, I really like this how-to model on building a, a school community partnership. Um, that's listed here, partnering for student success, um, a framework for building a successful community school is listed here as well. And then we've got some at an action guide for building effective integrated student support system, and then some tools for starting and building community schools. 
And so those four resources are um, very, very helpful when thinking about how to um, come up with a way to build a partnership. And then just lastly, we have um, some apps because we know that youth uh, tend to gravitate toward utilizing something that they can access on their phone. Um, so we wanna highlight the Dalio Journal, the Second Floor Youth Helpline, which we have a lot of our students access, My Life Meditation app, the Virtual Hope Box, which is one of my favorites, and then certainly uh, the Headspace app, which helps with meditation and sleep that many of you uh, may be aware of. And here are some of our references, and then we're gonna take it to the Q&A. So certainly feel free to type in some questions in the chat box. Yes, thank you so much, Sonia and Susie, for all of that very helpful information and also the incredibly helpful strategies that you shared. Um, really appreciate that. We actually have two questions that are already in the Q&A and um, we welcome others to share some questions. Other questions, um, if they're not answered here, we can also help to answer them later. So one of them is around um, the increasing need, and I'm going to paraphrase this a bit, um, in terms of mental health and social emotional um, skills that are really lagging behind, um, and whether, uh, and the tendency to go to tier three level supports. Um, and then in terms of based on the volume and nature of this need, do you see the benefit of uh, for mental health care, excuse me, shifting to more of a group based or tier two level supports to manage the high level of need? Great question. I think that we're always going to need both tiers because I think that you're going to always have youth who feel more comfortable um, talking about their um issues and their concerns in an individualized um, setting where they just don't feel comfortable sharing some of the things that um, they might be struggling with. You know, I have, I always encourage um, my clients and the, the youth that we work with to connect with group supports. Um, but I do find that particularly when there are, um, you know, some very sensitive issues that they have experienced that they're not quite comfortable sharing that in a group setting. Um, at the same time, I do feel like a group uh, a group can be very helpful for youth because it helps them not feel so isolated. It helps them feel like there are other people their age who have um, similar issues and then to learn about what everyone is doing or utilizing in terms of coping to help them through this difficult time. Do you want to add anything, Susie? Um, no, I think that's great. And I think too, as Sonia mentioned, there are kids who do definitely benefit from that group level. And I think sometimes what we're trying to do is also partner the, the group with the individual because there's certain strategies and skills that we can uh, teach in a uh, group and format. But then for individual kids who have a lot going on, having that individual space to then be able to process and specifically learn about how to use the skills in their personal life can be really valuable. And it looks like the second question here, how can elders be of help to youth? Um, I think this is a great question. Um, so our kids are really craving adults in their life who are able to be present and hear them out. And um, having that listening ear, as Sonia mentioned, sometimes stepping away from the teaching and telling them what they need to do and more so just hearing them out and validating their experience. So having that person that's willing to just sit with them um, and be able to hear out what their concerns are, how they're experiencing things. I think a lot of times as adults, we're quick to jump to solutions. Oh, you're having this problem, you're having this struggle, this is what you can do. Um, and when we're coming up with the solutions for them, some of our youth are going to push back and say, no, that's not going to work. I've already tried everything. Because what they're really craving is somebody to just validate what they're experiencing, what they're going through. We love to use problem solving frameworks, too, because then you're letting them express their feelings, validate what they're going through. And then you're partnering it with let's work together to see how to help you. Um, develop a solution. And then we're teaching that sense of resiliency, helping them feel successful. And we're also then building up self-esteem. 
Thank you so much. I hate to interrupt, but I know that we have only a few minutes left and um, we have to finish up the sort of evaluation portion. Um, I, I just want to give you one last word here. We have several questions that weren't answered and I apologize for running out of time here. Um, and we'll try to answer your questions um, in, a, in another, through email if possible. Okay, thank you so much, Sonia and Susie. Um, I'm going to turn over, excuse me, go ahead. I just said thank you. <laughs> I'm going to turn things over to Kati now, who is going to um, complete our our evaluation. And uh, we thank you very much. Please take some time um, for the rest of the slides and evaluation. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Alicia. And thank you, um, Dr. Millar and Sonia for um, providing us with a wonderful presentation this morning. Um, as Alicia mentioned, um, we invite you to take a moment to complete our short evaluation survey. I shared the link in the chat box and you can also access the uh, evaluation threat through scanning the QR code that you see on your screen. Next slide, please. We also invite you to um, subscribe to our podcast channel, um, Toward Wellness and Recovery, and you can find it on Spotify, Apple Music, or Podbean. We currently are featuring Flourishing at Work, a plan for helping professionals, and we think we may enjoy it and find it useful. Next slide, please. So if you um, joined us late today or you had to leave today or you know, you'd like to watch this webinar again, Again, this webinar has been recorded and will be posted on our website in, within seven days of this broadcast. And everyone will also receive a certificate of completion, as well as a link to the evaluation and a link to download the presenter slides. Next slide, please. Next slide. And again, if you'd like to connect with us or have any questions, you may email us at northeastcaribbean at mhttcnetwork.org or follow us on our several social media um, outlets. We have Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and our handles are located um, on the screen at this moment. Next slide. And again, we just want to um, thank you all for participating. We hope um, that you will join us again for any future training events and activities. Thank you again to our presenters. Alicia, thank you for your support during this webinar. And again, um, we hope you enjoy um, the rest of your day. Bye-bye.